Okay, so let's uh, start from the very first question uh, without wasting any time. It says, a uh, man stands on a merry-go-round that is rotating, oh, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm sharing the screen. <laughs> uh, uh, merry-go-round that is rotating at some angular momentum. Let me write that down. Uh, so this is giving you the angular momentum not angular momentum, angular velocity. If the coefficient of static friction between the man's shoes and the merry-go-round is some friction coefficient, how far from the axis of rotation can he stand without sliding? So uh, I like to start by drawing picture. So I'm imagining a merry-go-round. If you haven't heard the phrase before, you could Google it while you're doing one homework. It's a type of, um, a uh, kind of amusement park ride that rotates around an axis. You can think of it like a rotating platform that someone can stand on. So um, then um, we're talking about someone standing um, on some part of the merry-go-round. And so this person will be rotating along with the merry-go-round, same angular velocity as before. Hmm. So you might think, what is he talking about? Um, can you stand without sliding? So this is where visualization helps. Imagine having a round uh, platform that's rotating. Uh, why would uh, if it's already rotating? Why would anything slide? Um, I think I have one demo video that's posted on the course website. Uh, it's a demo video of a rotating platform. Um, with a uh, uh, kind of ball. Uh, I think I did it with a ball and also led, uh, with a masses as well. Masses sitting on it. And if I rotated it, if I rotated it too quickly, then the masses kind of uh, slid out. And this is where I hope you, uh, as you are visualizing that, that's the moment when I hope you will realize that this is undergoing a circular motion. So as the, this person object is undergoing circular motion, it must be undergoing centripetal acceleration. So that's really, um, that's really where this comes down to, that the information given in this problem allows you to relate the given quantities to centripetal acceleration. And, the end, um, uh, yeah, yeah. And at this point, this is where you should realize, oh, this is a force problem, which, you know, there was plenty of hint of. It's talking about friction coefficient, so there must be friction force involved. So uh, since I now recognize this as a standard strategy problem, let me uh, walk through the steps. So step number one is to draw free body diagram. So let's draw a free body diagram. Um, I guess I can draw it here so that I can kind of refer to the non-free body diagram that I was drawing. So I'm really drawing a free body diagram of this guy, this person here. And this is a good snapshot to draw a free body diagram. At. I'm imagining this particular moment in time and drawing the forces on this person at this moment in time. So there must be gravity on this person. And since he's not accelerating downward, there must be normal force. Now, usually you might have ended here. If he's at rest, then you would say. Um, but the reason we went over this discussion of how the motion being described involves circular motion, so it involves a centripetal acceleration, is as you are drawing this free body diagram, you should realize that, oh, the man is accelerating. There must be a net force on the man, and the net force is provided by this friction force. Okay, okay. Uh, so I have my uh, free body diagram drawn. That's step number one. Step number two is to define coordinate axis with the direction of acceleration in mind. So uh, let me call this my positive x direction. And I guess I can say y is perpendicular to that. Um, 
yeah, well, I should. <laughs> okay, uh, so step number two is done. I, we defined our coordinate axis. Step number three, there isn't anything to be done. The forces are already along x or y direction. Finally, step number four, we write down our Newton's second law of um, equations. And this is a mistake that a lot of people were making on the exam, that um, um, a lot of people were writing the Newton's second law equations for only one dimension when you should have written it for both the dimensions. So whenever in doubt, just to write it for all the dimensions you see. So I need the net force in the x direction that's going to be um, the friction force is equal to mass times acceleration. And if you want, for circular motion, at this stage, you can write in what the acceleration should be in terms of the quantities you have. So it's going to be mass times, um, so the, the kind of the formulaic form is V squared over R. That's what the formula says, the centripetal acceleration should be. And you need to make a sense of these uh, symbols in the context of your problem. So the question asks, how far from the axis of rotation? Let me give this quantity a uh, letter, D. And you can express both R and V in terms of this D here. Uh, we'll do that later. Uh, let's not get sidetracked here. So this is the net force along the x direction. You have acceleration and you should have non-zero net force, centripetal force that makes that acceleration happen. Um, all right, let's keep going. Uh, net force in the y direction is equal to normal force minus mg is equal to zero. Uh, normally, I might have skipped this. The reason I didn't here is because seeing the friction force, I realized that uh, normal force is not something we can skip on this question. I need to know what normal force is. So, you know, even though, um, uh, so this is the endo standard strategy, the rest is problem solving. Um, and now it gets a little, so, you know, as you are dealing with the rotation, as you are dealing with the more complex problems, your problem solving steps become more complex and not as obvious. So for example, how far from the axis of rotation? I identify the quantity as D, but that quantity is not to be found anywhere, um, anywhere here. You don't see anything that directly relates to D. So this is where you have to kind of look at these expressions for the appropriate amount of time and realize that both the velocity or speed and the r here, quote unquote r, they both relate to the distance uh, from the axis of rotation. So uh, that d there, it's this distance from the center to where the person is standing. So you can, hopefully, if you remember those tables relating the translational motion to rotational motion, so this uh, translational velocity, tangential velocity V, is given by the distance D times angular velocity. And oh, then, and that R is D. So using that information, uh, let me rewrite equation one. So from equation one, this is the expression you will get. Friction force is equal to mass times d squared omega squared divided by d. So I get d times omega squared. All right. So at least I now have that d that I'm looking for. Oh, or I guess I could have called it r. <laughs> and now as you are looking at this expression, you should realize that there's a lot of quantities that are not given here. You are not given the mass. You are not given the friction force. So, um, so that's why I didn't skip writing down equation two, because I knew that I can relate friction force to normal force and get it the necessary information that way. So let me write that down. From equation two, I can just solve it for normal force. So normal force N is equal to mg. And this is the expression that relates the normal force to the friction force, that the friction force 
uh, for static friction force, the maximum it can ever be is coefficient of friction force times the normal force. So for the extreme scenario, for, for the, um, so, so for the farthest distance, the max, this is what you can say. So um, for that extreme scenario, I take the situation where the friction force e is equal to the maximum. So you get mu s times n is equal to m times the maximum distance times omega squared. All right, so now I plug in what n is. n is equal to mg. So masses cancel out, that's uh, fortunate because I don't know the mass. And I, now I can solve for d max. Solving for d max, I get d max is equal to mu s g over omega squared. And you can plug in the numbers. Plugging in the numbers, you should get, well, you should get something, I don't know. <laughs> you can just plug in the numbers that are given there. Um, so that gives you the maximum distance that he can stand. If he stands out farther away, then because he's moving that much uh, faster, his tangential velocity is faster at this uh, uh, angular velocity, he will, uh, the, there won't be enough friction force to keep him in place. He will, um, well, it'll, he does move farther away from the axis. So he does, in some sense, slide outward but you know, in a tangential direction. Um, all right, so no questions, <laughs> then we'll move on.